Hello everyone and welcome to the talk Spectra, which is about new wireless escalation targets. This is a joint work by me, Miska and Francesco, who has been working a lot with Wi-Fi while I have been working with Bluetooth in the past. And in this work, we join our abilities to build a new attack scheme. So the motivation of this is as simple as this. I found a partial Bluetooth RCE a while ago, and then a bit later, a student of mine, Jan, built a fuzzle Frankenstein, which emulates the Bluetooth chips, and he also found a couple of more remote code executions. And with this, I said, like, yeah, that's a great chance. Now we can tour the world, tell everyone, like, we have Bluetooth remote code execution, take my unicorn, travel with it, and just show everyone. But the thing is that people said they are not too surprised about Bluetooth remote code execution because, you know, Bluetooth after 22 years is really indistinguishable from magic and they kind of expected that it is broken. And then people also told me, you know, there is Bluetooth RCE, there's Wi-Fi RCE and Wi-Fi RCE is much cooler because first of all, Bluetooth, it's connected via UART and Wi-Fi is connected with PCI Express that is just nicer for exploitation. And also, uh, if you can pop calc, it's a nice attack, but if you cannot pop calc, then what kind of attack is a Bluetooth on-chip remote code execution? So I was thinking, because now the idea is, of course, like I could try to like take the Bluetooth RC and then break into the operating system all the way up, but another funny attack would be to instead attack the Wi-Fi chip or maybe even the LTE chip, so to break the inter-chip separation instead of doing the same thing again of breaking into the operating system. And then I called uh, Francesco and said like, hey, let's build speculative transmission. And the idea of the attack was that in a smartphone you have the same uh, frequency used by Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and LTE has harmonics in the same spectrum and they cause interference in, in such a small device. So they need to arbitrate the channel access, which means they need to actually tell, I'm sending a packet, can you please not send a packet right now and so on, and also need to tell priorities and so on. And this is called a coex me uh, coexistence mechanism and it's a performance optimization. And of course, you could now also instead speculatively transmit a packet and use this to infer what the other cores are doing. So this was the initial attack idea. In the end, it turned out to be a bit more of a spectrum transmission, but this is the attack scheme. Of course, it requires a lot of uh, exploitation before, so it requires the Bluetooth remote code execution or a Wi-Fi remote code execution to then escalate into the other chip. But the interesting part here is, as this is a connection directly between the chips, you cannot block it with the operating system. So there is a very nice attack vector that is hard to prevent. And if you look into a modern iPhone, this is what it roughly looks like. So you have the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi chip, which are within a combo chip, but they still run on different ARM cores. And they are connected via the serial enhanced coexistence interface. This is what we are going to attack. The combo chip is also interconnected with an LTE chip, and this is using mobile wireless standards. And then you can also see that the Bluetooth daemon has fewer writes than the Wi-Fi daemon and the Bluetooth chip is usually connected with UART. The newer iPhones use PCI Express here. And now if you could escalate between the chips, you have new attacks path that, that become possible. So for example, um, I could now start from Bluetooth over the air and then escalate into Wi-Fi and then go all the way up. Or I could also try to infer timings in between those chips and so on. The spectral impact can be very different depending on how this coexistence interface is implemented. So first of all, the most obvious one is the denial of service. If one core denies transmission to another core, but it could also be information disclosure via timings or packet types and so on. And the worst case would be code execution. And for this one, you really need to screw up your implementation. When this attack has been first on the internet because of the Black Hat abstract, someone started tweeting and giving it other names. And I have to say, I also like the queer ghost attack, but uh, Spectra is like the original name. Of course, um, it's harder to find this on the internet because Spectra is just a very generic word. 
And now let's go for the Broadcom Coexistence interface, which we are now going to exploit. This is also present in a couple of Cypress chips because Cypress acquired parts of Broadcom in 2016. So it's synonymous to be used here. So don't be confused if I mix up Broadcom and Cypress, it's all the same. Actually, Broadcom is a very nice target because they don't do any firmware checks. And no firmware checks means that if we are able to reverse engineer certain parts of the firmware, then we can also patch it within Wi-Fi and within Bluetooth. And there are no further checks, which means that there is no secure boot, no signature checking, etc. So you still need to understand what is going on to patch such a chip, but then there are no further security measures to prevent this. And those chips are in many, many, many devices. So for example, all iPhones, all MacBooks, iMacs, and also the older Apple Watches, the newest ones have a different one, the Samsung Galaxy S series, the older Google Nexus phones, all Raspberry Pis, a couple of IoT devices, and so on. So this is a very nice prototyping platform for all kinds of attacks. If you look into the older data sheets, you can also find a couple of details, still not everything, but the newer data sheets just don't exist. So we need to live with what is there, what is documented. And what you can see here, there's this Bluetooth chip, there is a Wi-Fi chip, they share an antenna, so they need to arbitrate access onto this one. And then there is a lot of stuff going on between those chips, which we are going to attack in the following. Nonetheless, they have different ARM cores. So this one has an ARM Cortex-M3, there's the Cortex-R4 and so on. So this is still separated in some ways. For understanding the uh, attacks, now we need to understand the serial enhanced coexistence interface, which is used between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. It's also called ECI, so without the serial and GCI, which might be global or generic coexistence interface but it's all used in the same way in the data sheets. To understand it, the best way is to actually separate Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And in this setup, you can see that there is a Bluetooth and a Wi-Fi board by Cypress. They don't have a shared antenna, so everything is separate. There are no side effects. And the only connection that they have is the serial enhanced coexistence interface, which we can now also intercept. So that means that we are actually able to observe each and every signal that is sent between those two boards. And there is nothing else that is going on that could block a transmission. If you look into this in detail, first of all, we did the experiments of streaming just some music over Bluetooth. And then on the Wi-Fi chip, we did a scan for other Wi-Fi's. You can see a peak when you start the scan. Actually, it's two peaks. Uh, and then there are a couple of other peaks when you get the scan results and the end of the scan. And what is very interesting about this protocol already at this level is that the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are sending with three megabytes over the serial interface. And three megabytes is also the same amount of data that is sent from the Bluetooth chip to the host to send the actual music of the stream. So you can imagine how much data there is within the coexistence interface. And now you can see that Bluetooth is within each peak actually sending some data that is annotated in hex here and also wi-fi is sending some data so each tiny peak there really has some information about the task that is running and other stuff that tells priorities of packets and in the last example you can also see a bluetooth keyboard which has regular peaks that is then being sent um, while wi-fi is idle so this is roughly what it looks like just to give you some idea about this protocol in the first attack, we didn't even need to understand all the details of this. It's just a simple reconfiguration of this interface. So there are a lot, a lot, a lot of registers that are mapped into the Bluetooth ARM core that you can write into or read from. And actually, I tried to understand all of them in the very beginning, and you can also do fancy stuff with this. but. I didn't understand all of them. And then Francesco just told me, well, if you don't understand it, just try breaking it. Just write something in all those registers and see what breaks. And I found out when I write just Fs into the CCI chip control, this crashes Wi-Fi. And more interestingly, in this evaluation board setup, I could even see some voltage drop on the logic analyzer. This was very weird. 
And on some devices, this even causes a kernel panic because upon writing to the GCI chip control within Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi might stop or even spam stuff over PCI Express and so on. And then there are very weird effects from this. I tested it on a couple of devices, so starting from the Nexus 5, but then also going all the way up to the newest MacBooks and iPhones and so on, and the Samsung Galaxy S10, S20. And what you can see here is that, first of all, depending on the date of the chip, you have a slightly different scheme, but on the newest ones, you just write Fs into one address. And already this is sufficient to have a kernel panic on a lot of those devices. On some of them, it's also just Wi-Fi that restarts and that's it. Now, this already looks very promising for such a simple attack. And because of this, we tried to build more fancy attacks with this primitive. And this is what Francesco is now going to tell you about. Thanks, Jiska, for introducing this part of the talk. Let's start describing the Broadcom Wi-Fi chipset. In the last two decades, it evolved from a soft Mac to a full Mac implementation, and functions that were originally running on the Linux host at the top are today offloaded by an intermediate ARM core. Interestingly, low-level operations are always managed by the same piece of hardware that did not change much in 70 years. No matter which Wi-Fi chipset we are using, time-critical operations are managed by the same D 11 microcontroller that coordinates phi, radio frequency and DMA operations. Let's have a closer look to the low level. The D11 microcontroller runs the microcode, a short piece of software that keeps checking hardware conditions and triggers specific operations. We see here some code from the main loop that checks if the phi started receiving a PLCP preamble or if the current reception is terminated. In such cases, it will execute the corresponding handler that will decide what to do with the current frame. This other piece of code is extracted from the part that schedules the transmission of an acknowledgement. We see the preparation of the reply frame that starts with D4 as usual. The D11 toolchain was created by Michael Buech in 2007. We incorporated it inside our NetOne project and we periodically update it by adding new instructions when a new chipset is introduced. As spotting the U-code in the ARM binary blob is easy, we can modify it adding customized parts as we will see later. The D11 CPU coordinates many blocks. First of all, it controls the transmission and reception engines, it manages channels access by scheduling transmissions, and decides which received frames should be pushed to the ARM core. It can configure the PHY and the radio, and it does so by running the U-code that is loaded into the U-code memory by the ARM firmware during initialization. D11 has access to an 8 kilobyte shared memory, where it keeps its configuration and state variables. And it also accesses indirectly the ARM memory, where packets ready for transmissions are queued for deciding which packets can be transmitted or aggregated. D11 is equipped with general purpose timers and with many different interfaces for talking to other parts of the chipset, like the SECI interface. During the years, it turned out to be a pretty flexible architecture and we used it as a research platform for showcasing operations like jamming, piggybacking schemes and time of flight measurements. Let's now talk about D11 coexistence interface. It includes quite a number of registers and a 64-bit buffer for receiving messages from the Bluetooth. Such messages are transmitted by Bluetooth every 1.25 milliseconds. It is the minimum Bluetooth connection interface. They report to Wi-Fi the timing and type of all Bluetooth operations. Wi-Fi copies this information inside dedicated SECI countdown timers that defer Wi-Fi operations and prevent collisions. On the opposite direction, Wi-Fi uses the Bluetooth transmission control register in red for granting Bluetooth access to the chat. The flow of messages in the two directions builds a grant reject scheme. As we will see, in our attacks, we use the knowledge we collected on such registers for breaking such schemes. According to our analysis, more than 10% of the U-code is dedicated to coexistence. As in general, many other operations take much less code, we understand how much complex is the coexistence interface. Finally, by programming two boards for transmitting SECI messages when receiving the same Wi-Fi beacon, we measured, with the help of an external FPGA, the jitter of the SECI line. It turned out to be Gaussian with a 200 nanosecond deviation, which is perfect for this application. So let's see how we broke the grant reject scheme. We did that to see the effects when watching a movie, 
that requires to download content over the Wi-Fi and send audio to a Bluetooth headset. At the bottom, in green, we see SECI grant messages transmitted by the Wi-Fi. Bluetooth uses them for understanding when it can transmit audio to the headset. We introduced into the U-code a few lines for configuring the Wi-Fi chipset remotely from the air interface. We can hence prevent the Wi-Fi from sending SECI grant messages to Bluetooth. You see this happens between 2.6 and 3.5 seconds. During this interval no more SECI messages are transmitted and, in fact, we cannot hear any sound from the headset. We tested this both on a Nexus 5 and on undevelopment boards from Cypress. This experiment clearly demonstrates that a denial of service attack from the Wi-Fi side against Bluetooth is possible. Let's take a closer look now at the messages that Bluetooth sends to Wi-Fi and if we can use such information for an attack. These are the SECI time diagrams when we have a keyboard connected over Bluetooth. Depending on the keyboard, we can observe SECI messages transmitted every 15 or 30 milliseconds. Bluetooth sends these SECI messages to inform Wi-Fi that it is going to pull the keyboard so that Wi-Fi defers channel access meanwhile. In this diagram, Wi-Fi is idle, so Wi-Fi always grants access to Bluetooth. This is what happens when somebody is actually typing on a keyboard. At the bottom we have the periodic sequence of SECI messages, on top we have the key presses sniffed by Wireshark when capturing from the Bluetooth interface. As we are typing with moderate speed, each key press is separate from the others, and we can also see the Bluetooth message with key release following each key press. In between we can see the HID data captured by Wireshark with a specific event ID that represents a key press. Below we see SECI messages that we filtered on the Wi-Fi chipset by selecting the the same message type. This demonstrates that at the Wi-Fi side we can easily distinguish SECI messages related to key presses. This clearly demonstrates that having access to the Wi-Fi chipset is enough for measuring key press timings with very accurate resolution. And we know that in some cases, with the help of some artificial intelligence or classification technique, this is enough for guessing what a user is typing. We hence believe that without any further protection, the SEC interface can be used for mounting side channel attacks, and we requested the CVE for reporting the associated vulnerability. Francesca, the ground is yours again. Thank you, Francesco, for the very detailed explanations about the Zero Enhanced Coexistence interface and attacks on it. There is still one thing mentioned in the data sheet which was clearly missing, which is the WLAN RAM sharing. And in the following, we are also going to attack this. I would call this effect when you spend too much time looking for very fancy side channels and dig deeper into all of this and try to explore them, while there is the one obvious thing in a data sheet that you just couldn't find within the serial enhanced code existence interface. And for us, this was this WLAN RAM sharing. So it must be somewhere, it's in the data sheet errors, just go into one direction here from Bluetooth to Wi Fi. And we just didn't understand where it is and couldn't find it for quite a long time. And the reason for this is that the Cypress boards come with some development kit and within this there are some symbol leaks, but the problem here is there's nothing mentioned with WLAN. And so there probably is no WLAN RAM sharing, I thought. Maybe it's just another word for the enhanced coexistence mappings. But then there was also another part of symbols and I was able to obtain a ROM image. And it's not from a development board, but actually from a MacBook. And within those symbols, there suddenly were a few called W and buff, W and buff something. So um, it looked a bit like probably the shared RAM, but it were just functions. And then I analyzed those functions. And there was one function that was polling somewhere in the 680000 region. And actually, when I saw this, then I tried to read it. It sometimes crashes if you don't do it in the right order and so on. But in the beginning of the section, I actually saw, wow, there is a string 80211 something on the device where I did this. And then I was like, probably I'm already in there. Still to confirm it, I instead tried writing to it. And when I write to this, what happens is that quite often the Wi-Fi crashes. So within Bluetooth, I write into those registers and suddenly Wi-Fi crashes. And the nice part about a Wi-Fi crash is that on a couple of devices, this is causing a crash dump, and this crash dump actually contains 
parts of the RAM image. So I could write data that I know and try to find the same data again to make the mapping and find like how Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are wrapped into each other. And also it revealed a couple of pointers, function pointers. So within the function pointer table, I was just overwriting a couple of pointers and it turned out that within this position, there is a pointer table. And when I write to this, I can get the program counter under control. So I can write to RAM, I can set the program counter so I can have code execution. And that was really amazing. I have a demo video for this on a MacBook. The mapping is slightly different. So on the left-hand side, I use internal blue to write assembly instructions because I'm just writing within a function and not within a function pointer. And then on the right-hand side, you see the Wi-Fi crash logs on macOS and you can see that I can get a program counter under control. And this is how fast this attack works. So just within Bluetooth, I can get code execution in Wi-Fi. The interesting part here is that I couldn't find this area on the Nexus 5. So either it's not mapped at all or it's mapped to a different region, even though this was the one that I initially had um, as the idea, like from this data sheet, there must be this Wi-Fi RAM sharing. But so this one, I didn't find it. Then there are a couple of devices where within the ROM dump, you can even find the 680000 and so on. So you know that within the firmware, this is used and on those also the attack works. The fun part here is that the MacBook, I don't have it with me. I just have this dump. So I couldn't try it on my own on this MacBook but at least I, I know it should work because the symbol is there. And in the newest devices, this register is never ever mentioned uh, in the firmware, but still the attack works. So it's probably a feature that has been abandoned and it's no longer used, but still we can use it for this type of attack on all those devices. The even more fun part is that sometimes I got again issues with PCI Express. So why is that? On all those chips, I had no idea what exactly I was doing. So, I mean, yes, there is the mapping, but I first of all need to get the chip to crash to get this RAM image. And then I need to load it into IDA and analyze it and somehow find a place to get code execution for each chip. And so I was just writing certain things. And then again, like sometimes finding a pattern again. And when I find the pattern like in the program counter, then I probably have code execution. So this was roughly my approach. And then on a couple of devices, this turned out to be a very efficient fuzzle. So just flipping a couple of bytes somewhere in the shared memory between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth was sufficient to get kernel panics on a couple of devices. So sometimes just Wi-Fi crashes, but sometimes even kernel panics. And this is interesting because there are, of course, also some memory areas that are used for the PCI Express queue between the Wi-Fi chip and the host and so on, or it might just simply block something within the communication between the Wi-Fi chip and the host. And depending on this, it can already cause a reboot. So with the super simple fuzzle of just flipping some bytes uh, or like exchanging some bytes, we can reboot devices. And this is a capture of this. I just use an iPhone 6 because on this one it's very fast. It also works on a couple of other devices. And you can see, first of all, Wi-Fi is switched off. So that's on the left hand side. And then the device is already rebooting. Now you might wonder what the patch looks like. And I mean, a lot of this is in hardware, so you cannot really patch it. But what I have seen uh, in, in a couple of devices is that they are now blocking the communication. So after the Bluetooth chip is initialized by the Bluetooth daemon, the Bluetooth chip is then blocking any uh, write RAM, read RAM commands, or at least writing. The reading is only blocked on a few devices, but writing is blocked on all newer uh, chips as far as I've seen. And now the thing is that this prevents at least a text where the Bluetooth daemon would try to get code execution within Wi-Fi. So that's like this path. But what is not prevented by this is if you have remote code execution over the air and then escalate into Wi-Fi. Or if you just know that the timing between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is a fixed one by now and use the known timing, which is not random because of something sent over the air, but actually like predictable because of coexistence schemes, this might also be a thing that's exploitable here. But at least 
they added this to the attack model that suddenly Bluetooth might be able to attack Wi-Fi. And because of this, this part is now blocked because you can block this quite easily. And now I mentioned in the beginning that this might also apply to other chips. And now the question here is like, what are the chips? If you look into the Bluetooth specification um, and read it backwards, because I mean, I'm a reverse engineer, so I also read the specification backwards, obviously. What you can see on the last page is the Bluetooth logo. And on the second last page, it already starts with the mobile wireless standards. And this is another serial um, protocol, which is used between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chips or Bluetooth chips and LTE. And they are also sending activity information and so on over UART. And then there is another thing that goes via the operating system to initially, uh, initially uh, configure it. And this one is also used on iPhones. So I saw it on iPhone, so it probably is also attackable on them. And because everyone has some proprietary coexistence features, we asked Broadcom if we can also include other manufacturers in the responsible disclosure process. And they said, yes, we can. And so we informed a couple of those who at least mentioned that they have coexistence in their data sheets and so on. And some of their responses were like that this doesn't really apply to them because there are some chips that have uh, just one core that handles multiple wireless protocols. So by definition, that wouldn't be attackable in the sense of you already have code execution either way. So Bluetooth remote code execution is automatically a Wi-Fi remote code execution. But of course, there might be other side channels like I can now from the timing of Wi-Fi frames that I send on an upper layer, maybe predict uh, how the, the typing on a keyboard or something was, for example, or how the activity was on the other wireless core. And this might be something that could still be possible, even though the uh, code execution is kind of by design and cannot be prevented. There might be further attacks. And as a summary, so what we reached is if you have a Bluetooth remote code execution on a Broadcom chip, you can now cause driver kernel panics, get information disclosure about Wi-Fi and even code execution within Wi-Fi. And the other way around, if you have a Wi-Fi remote code execution, you can now do denial of service against Bluetooth and also get information disclosure within Bluetooth. If you have further questions, there will be a Q&A session. And you can, of course, also reach me on Twitter or you can write an email to Francesco and me. Thanks for listening.